He's got 
he turned his head away. I dropped my gaze, embarrassed, and that's when I saw it. The first dandelion of the year. A bell went off in my head. I thought of the hours spent in the woods with my father, and I knew how we were going to survive. To this day, I can never shake the connection between this boy, Peter Malark, and, and the breath that gave me hope. Must know what's coming. You can't leave again, I 
say. My mother's eyes find the floor. I know. I won't. I couldn't help. Well, you have to help with it this time. You can't clock out and leave Prim on her own. There's no mean to keep you both alive. It, it doesn't matter what happens. Whatever you see on the screen, you have to promise me you will fight through it. My voice is risen to her shout. It is all this anger, all the fear. I feel her abandonment. She pulls her arm from my grasp, moved to anger herself now. I was ill. I could have treated myself if I had the medicine I have now. The part about her being ill might be true. I've seen her bring back people suffering from immobilizing sadness since. Perhaps it is a sickness, but it's one we can't afford. Then take it and take care of her, I say. I'll be all right, Katniss, says Prim, clasping my face in her hands. But you have to take care, too. You're so fast and brave. Maybe you can win. I can't win. Prim must know that in her heart. The competition will be far beyond my abilities. Kids from wealthier districts where winning is a huge honor. Who've been trained their whole lives for this. Boys who are two to three times my size. Girls who know 20 different ways to kill you with a knife. Oh, there'll be people like me, too. People to weed out before the real fun begins. Maybe, I say, because I can hardly tell my mother to carry on if I've already given up myself. Besides, it isn't in my nature to go down without a fight, even when things seem insurmountable. Then we'd be as rich as Hamish. I don't care for rich. I just want you to come home. You will try, won't you? Really, really try? Asks Prim. Really, really try. I swear it, I say. And I know because of Prim. I'll have to. And then the peacekeepers at the door signaling our time is up. And we're all hugging one another so hard it hurts. And all I'm saying is, I love you. I love you both. And they're saying it back. And the peacekeeper orders them out. And the door closes. I bury my head in one of the velvet pillows as if this can block the entire thing out. Someone else enters the room. And when I look up, I'm surprised to see it's the baker. Peter Malark's father. I can't believe he's come to visit me. After all, I'll be trying to kill his son soon. But we do know each other a little bit. And he knows Prim even better. When he, she sells her goat Jesus at the hobby, puts two of them aside for him, and he gives her a generous amount of bread in return. We always wait to trade with him when his witch of a wife isn't around because he's so much nicer. I feel certain he never would have hit his son the way she did over the burned bread. But why has he come to see me? The baker sits awkwardly on the edge of one of the plush chairs. He's a big, broad-shouldered man with burn scars from years at the ovens. He must have just said goodbye to his son. He pulls a white paper package from his jacket pocket and holds it out to me. I open it and find cookies. These are a luxury we can never afford. Thank you, I say. The baker's not a very talkative man in the best of times, and today he has no words at all. I had some of your bread this morning. My friend Gail gave you a squirrel for it. He nods as if remembering the squirrel. <laughs> Not your best trade, I say. He shrugs as if it couldn't possibly matter. Then I can't think of anything else, so we sit in silence until a peacemaker summons him. He rises and coughs to clear his throat. I'll keep an eye on the little girl. Make sure she's eating. I feel some of the pressure in my chest lighten at his words. People deal with me, but they are genuinely fond of Prim. Maybe there will be enough fondness to keep her alive. My next guess is also unexpected. Madge walks straight to me. She's not weepy or evasive. Instead, there's an urgency about her tone that surprises me. They let you wear one thing from your district in the arena. One thing to remind you of home. Will you wear this? She holds out the circular gold pin that was on her dress earlier. I hadn't paid much attention to it before, but now I see it's a small bird in flight. That's the pin. Your pin, I say, wearing a token from my district is about the last thing on my mind. Here, I'll put it on your dress, alright? Madge doesn't wait for an 
comes in and fixes the bird to my dress. Promise you'll wear it into the arena, Katniss? She asks. Promise? Uh, yes, I say. Cookies. A pin. I'm getting all kinds of gifts today. Match gives me one more. A kiss on the cheek. Then she's gone and I'm left thinking that maybe Match really had been my friend all along. Finally, Gail is here and maybe there is nothing romantic between us, but when he opens his arms, I don't hesitate to go into them. His body is familiar to me. The way it moves. The smell of wood smoke. Even the sound of his heart beating. I know from quiet moments on a hunt. But this is the first time I really feel it. Lean and hard-muscled against my own. Listen, he says. Getting a knife should be pretty easy, but you've got to get your hands on a bow. That's your best chance. They don't always have bows, I say, thinking of the year where there were only horrible spiked maces that the tributes to bludgeon one another to death with. Then make one, says Gail. Even a weak bow is better than no bow at all. I've tried copying my father's bows with poor results. It's not that easy. Even he had to scrap his own work sometimes. I don't know if they'll even be wood, I say. Another year, they tossed everybody into a landscape of nothing but boulders and sand and scruffy bushes. I particularly hated that year. Many contestants were bitten by venomous snakes or went insane from thirst. There's almost always some wood, Gil says, since that year half of them died of cold. Not much entertainment in that. It's true. We spent one Hunger Games watching the players freeze to death at night. You could hardly see them, because they were just huddled in balls and had no wood for fire or torches or anything. It was considered considered very anticlimactic in the capital, all those quiet, bloodless deaths. Since then, there's usually been wood to make fires. Yes, there's usually some, I say. Katniss? It's just hunting. You're the best hunter I know, says Gail. It's not just hunting. They're armed. They think, I say. So do you. And you've had more practice. Real practice, he says. You know how to kill. Not people, I say. How different can it be, really? Says Gail grimly. The awful thing is that if I can forget their people, it will be no different at all. Peacekeepers are back too soon, and Gail asks for more time, but they're taking them away, and I start to panic. Don't let them starve, I cry out, clinging to his hand. I won't. You know I won't. Katniss, remember, I, he says, and I yank us apart and slam the door. And I'll never know what it was he wanted me to remember. It's a short ride from the Justice Building to the train station. I've never been in a car before, rarely even ridden in wagons the same we travel on foot. I've been right not to cry. The station is swarming of reporters with their insect-like cameras trained directly on my face. But I've had a lot of practice at wiping my face clean of emotions, and I do this now. I catch a glimpse of myself in the television screen on the wall that's airing my arrival live and feel gratified that I appear almost bored. Peter Malark, on the other hand, has obviously been crying, and interestingly enough, does not seem to be trying to cover it up. I immediately wonder if this will be his strategy in the games. To appear weak and frightened, to reassure the other tributes that he's no competition at all, and then come out fighting. This worked very well for a girl, Joanna Mason, from District 7 a few years back. She seemed like such a sniveling, cowardly fool that no one bothered her until there were only a handful of contestants left. It turned out that she could kill viciously. Pretty clever the way she played it. But this seems an odd strategy for Peter Malark. Because he's a baker's son, all those years of having enough to eat and hauling bread trays around have made him broad-shouldered and strong. It will take an awful lot of weeping to convince anyone to overlook him. We have to stand for a few minutes in the doorway of the train while the cameras gobble up our images. Then we're allowed inside, and the doors close mercifully behind us. The train begins to move at once. The speed initially takes my breath away. Of course, I've never been on a train. As travel between the districts is forbidden, except for officially sanctioned duties. For us, that's mainly transporting coal, but this is no ordinary coal train. 
cities. District 12 was in a region known as Appalachia. Even hundreds of years ago, they mined coal here, which is why our miners have to dig so deep. Somehow, it all comes back to coal at school, besides basic reading and math, most of our instruction is coal-related, except for the weekly lecture on the history of Pan Am. It's mostly a lot of blather about what we owe the capital. I know there must be more than they're telling us, an actual account of what happened during the rebellion, but I don't spend too much time thinking about it. Whatever the truth is, I don't see how well me get food on the table. The tribute train is fancier than even the room in the Justice Building. We are each given our own chambers that have a bedroom, a dressing area, and a private bathroom with hot and cold running water. We don't have hot water at home unless we boil it. There are drawers filled with fine clothes, and every drink it tells me to do anything I want. Wear anything I want, everything is at my disposal. Just be ready for supper in an hour. I peel off my mother's blue dress and take a hot shower. I've never had a shower before. It's like being in a summer rain, only warmer. I dress in a dark green shirt and pants. At the last minute, I remember Madge's little gold pin. And for the first time, I get a good look at it. It's as if someone fashioned a small golden bird and then attached a ring around it. The bird is connected to the ring only by its wingtips. I suddenly recognize it. A mocking jay. They're funny birds and something of a slap in the face to the capital. During the rebellion, the capital bred a series of genetically altered animals as weapons. The common term for them was mutations, or sometimes mutts for short. One was a special bird called a jabberjay that had the ability to memorize and repeat all human conversations. They were homing birds, exclusively male, that were released into regions where the capital's enemies were known to be hiding. After the birds gathered words, they'd fly back to centers to be recorded. It took people a while to realize what was going on in the districts, how private conversations were being transmitted. Then, of course, the rebels fed the capital endless lies, and the joke was on it. So the centers were shut down, and the birds were abandoned to die off in the wild. Only they didn't die off. Instead, the jabberjays made it with female mockingbirds, creating a whole new species that could replicate both bird whistles and human melodies. They had lost the ability to enunciate words, but could still mimic a range of human vocal sounds, from a child's high-pitched warble to a man's deep tones, and they could recreate songs. Not just a few notes, but whole songs of multiple verses if you had the patience to sing them and if they lacked her voice. My father was particularly fond of mocking jays. When we went hunting, he would whistle or sing complicated songs to them, and after a polite pause, they'd always sing back. Not everyone is treated with such respect, but whenever my father sang, all the birds in the area would fall silent and listen. His voice was that beautiful, high and clear, and so filled with life it made you want to laugh and cry at the same time. I could never bring myself to continue the practice after he was gone. Still, there's something comforting about the little bird. It's like having a piece of my father with with me, protecting me. I fasten the pin onto my shirt. Green fabric as a background, I can almost imagine the mocking jay flying through the trees. Every drink it comes to collect me for supper. I follow her through the narrow rocking corridor into a dining room with polished paneled walls. There's a table where all the dishes are highly breakable. Peter Millark sits waiting for us, the chair next to him empty. Where's he, Mitch? asks Effie Trinket brightly. Last time I see him, uh, he said he was going to take a nap, says Peter. <laughs> well, it's been an exhausting day, says Effie Trinket. I think she's relieved by Amidge's absence, and who can blame her? The supper comes in courses. A thick carrot soup, green salad, lamb chops, and mashed potatoes, cheese, and fruit. A chocolate cake. Throughout the meal, Effie Trinket keeps reminding us to save space because there's more to come, but I'm stuffing 
myself because I've never had food like this so good and so much and because probably the best thing I can do between now and the games is put on a few pounds at least you do have decent manners since this Effie as we're finishing the main course the pair last year ate everything with their hands like a couple of savages completely upset my digestion the pair last year were two kids from the seam who never not one day in their lives had enough to eat, and when they did have food, table manners were surely the last thing on their minds. Pete is a baker's son. My mother taught Prim and me to eat properly, so yes, I can handle a fork and knife. But I hate Effie Trinket's comments so much. I make a point of eating the rest of my meal with my fingers, and I wipe my hands on the tablecloth. This makes her purse her lips tightly together. Now that the meal's over, I'm fighting to keep the food down. I can see Peter's looking a little green, too. Neither of our stomachs is used to such rich fare. But if I can hold down Greasy Say's concoction of mice, meat, pig entrails, and tree bark, a winter specialty, I'm determined to hang on to this. We go to another compartment to watch the recap of the reapings across Panem. They try to stagger them throughout the day so a person could conceivably watch the whole thing live. But only people in the capital could really do that, since none of them have to attend reaping them reapings themselves. One by one, we see the other reapings. The names called the volunteers stepping forward, or more often, not. We examine the faces of the kids. It will be our competition. A few stand out in my mind. A monstrous boy who lunges forward to duck volunteer from District 2. A fox-faced girl with sleek red hair from District 5. A boy with a crippled foot from District 10. And, most hauntingly, a 12-year-old girl from District 11. She has dark brown skin and eyes. But other than that, she's very like Prim in size and demeanor. Only when she mounts the stage and they ask for volunteers, all you can hear is the wind whistling through the decrepit buildings around her. There's no one willing to take her place. Last of all, they show District 12, Prim being called me running forward to volunteer. You can't miss the desperation in my voice as I shove Prim behind me, as I'm afraid no one will hear and they'll take Prim away. But of course they do hear. I see Gail pulling her off me and, and watch myself mount the stage. The commenters are, the commentators are not sure what to say about the crowd's refusal to applaud. The silent salute. One says that District 12 has always been a bit backward, but that local customs can be charming. As if on cue, Hamish falls off the stage and they groan comically. Peter's name is drawn and he quietly takes his place. We shake hands. They cut to the anthem again. And the program ends. Effie Trinket is disgruntled about the state her wig was in. Your mentor has a lot to learn about presentation. A lot about televised behavior. Peter unexpectedly laughs. He was drunk, says Peter. He's drunk every year. Every day, I add. I can't help smirking a little. Every drink it makes it sound like Hamish just has somewhat rough manners that could be corrected with a few tips from her. Yes, this is every drink it. How odd you do find it amusing. You know your mentor is your lifeline to the world in these games. The one who advises you, who lines up your sponsors, and dictates the presentation of any gifts. Image can well be the difference between your life and death. Just then, Image staggers into the compartment. I'm a supper, he says in a slurred voice. Then he vomits all over the expensive carpet and falls in the mess. So laugh away, says Effie Trinket. She hops in her pointy shoes around the pool of vomit and flees the room. That was chapters two and three of The Hunger Games by Suzanne Collins. And like I said, that is probably all I will be reading of I don't want to get, like, copyright 